Hello, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nation's oldest public affairs discussion forum. The panel is presented in association with San Francisco Opera. I'm Dr. Ann W. Smith, co-chair of the Arts Forum of the Commonwealth Club. For this virtual program, we are happy to welcome you to participate in a very special experience with the Commonwealth Club. Most opera fans were never aware, like me, before finding out about Omar of Muslim enslavement as part of American antebellum history, the time between the formation of the U.S. government and the outbreak of the Civil War. Omar, the opera by Rhiannon Giddens and Michael Abels is a truly different story produced as a truly different contemporary lyric opera. It was premiered in 2022 at the Charleston uh, Spoleto Music Festival, and it was the winner of the 2023 Pulitzer Prize for Music. The work was recognized for its expansion of the traditional opera canon challenging standard practice and repertoire with musical influences from the Muslim diaspora, spirituals, bluegrass, hymns, and the earliest melody transcribed from enslaved people in North America. This is a true story of an astonishing journey enshrined in a 200-year-old autobiography of enslaved Islamic scholar Omar ibn Said in the Carolinas, who publicly records his story in Arabic, evidencing the act of writing as a preservation of identity. And it's a sweeping canvas of text, Christian, and Islamic faith. It's profoundly realized, <clears throat> excuse me, in Kanisa Shal's transcendent opera production that also embodies the horrors of the Middle Passage in slave ships, prison life, plantation traumas, and the support of the creative human spirit. <clears throat> the opera so far has been presented at Spoleto, uh, Carolina Performing Arts at University of North Carolina. Um, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Detroit Opera, L.A. Opera, and it's that going to and it's just going to open at San Francisco Opera. Also, will be at Boston Lyric Opera and Lyric uh, Lyric Opera of Chicago. All co commissioners, so, so it's quite a special experience. I'm totally excited to have joining us today with evocative commentary and references to. Remember the name and tell the story. A panel of San Francisco Opera Company representatives and Omar Ibn Said's biographers of I Cannot Write My Life. Cole Thomas and Ritas, a member of the club's Volunteer Arts Forum <clears throat> and content curator for San Francisco Opera's Equity, Diversity and Community Department is your program organizer for today's meeting. So Cole, turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for everybody that is with us today. As Anne said, my name is Cole thomas Ritas, and I'm with the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Community at San Francisco Opera. Whether you're watching us live or later on on YouTube or the club's, channel, um, club's website, we welcome you both to the Commonwealth Club and to San Francisco Opera. We are, of course, here today to discuss the life of enslaved Islamic scholar Omar ibn Said through the context of the opera under his name, Omar, by Pulitzer Prize winning composers Rihanna Giddens and Michael Abels. We have a glorious panel with us today. Let me introduce them. First, members of our cast, we have mezzo soprano Taylor Raven, who hails from Hope Mills, North Carolina. She's portraying the role of Fatima, Omar's, Omar's mother, in our San Francisco Opera production. She's also been seen at San Francisco Opera in John Adams' Antony and Cleopatra, and Poulenc's Dialogue of the Carmelites, as well as Flora in La Traviata. We also have soprano Brittany Renee, who comes from Minneapolis, Minnesota, 
and she plays the role of Julie in Omar. Uh, she was also seen in Fire Shut Up in My Bones at the Metropolitan Opera and Lyric Opera of Chicago. And that, of course, was by Terrence Blanchard and Kazi Lemon. Conductor, our maestro of this production, as well as the premiere at the Spoleto USA Festival, conductor John Kennedy, also from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we have our esteemed professors, co-authors of the biography of Omar, I Cannot Write My Life. Professor Mbaye Lo, originally from Senegal, is the Associate Professor of the Practice of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and International Comparative Studies at Duke University. And Professor Carl W. Ernst, born in Los Angeles, he is the William R. Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Islamic Studies at the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome everybody to this fabulous panel. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I would like to start by sharing with you all the first paragraph of the introduction of this wonderful biography, I Cannot Write My Life. This book is about Omar Ibn Said, a West African scholar who was enslaved in the Carolinas for over half a century. Upon his death in 1863 in Bladen County, North Carolina, Omar, as we will call him, left behind a small body of Arabic writings, including his 1831 autobiography that became a source of both wonder and incomprehension. Even his name proved to be a challenge. The varying forms that were used to refer to him, Moreau, Omaro, Moro, Moreau, Monroe, and so on, seemed to confirm the enigma that he posed. We write his name as Omar Ibn Said, following the most common spelling even though it is incorrect. We refer to him by his personal name, Omar, since the paternal name used for him is both incorrect, it is properly written as Bin Said, son of Said, and not equivalent to a last name in the English style. Omar has also become the symbol of enslaved Muslim scholars' presence in the antebellum United States. The Library of Congress has created an Omar Ibn Said collection of documents in English and Arabic to serve as a resource for research on slavery and Islam in America. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper declared May 23, 2019 to be Omar Ibn Said Day. Musician Rihanna Giddens has written an opera based on Omar's story that had its debut at the 2022 Spoleto Festival. Again, that is the opening paragraph of the introduction to I Cannot Write My Life, Omar's biography by Professors Mbaye Lo and Carl W. Ernst. Professors, thank you so much for being here with us today. What a beautiful opening to that book. And what a wonderful segue in that you end that paragraph by highlighting this opera. Thank you for being here with us today. And I want to give you guys the floor to present to us about this wonderful biography. Well, thank you, uh, Cole, for uh, inviting us. And thank you, Anne, for such a wonderful uh, introduction. Delighted to be here and to talk about Omar. Uh, you can just move to the next page quickly. Um, here are a few points that we would like to talk about, myself and Professor Ern. The next. So let us just briefly talk about this book and the background. Uh, in 2019, I was co-teaching a course on uh, Arabic of American slavery with uh, Professor Ernst, and we brought both Duke and UNC students together to review and think through a legacy of Arabic left behind by unslaved African. And Omar just stood out. So, uh, Professor Ernst, I, I must accept that suggested to me we should move on and produce a monograph about Omar because Omar was a witness and victim of racism. So that is how we started this book, basically. So here are the main issues that we're trying to discover in this book and talk about. Uh, next one. And uh, before we go back, go back to the previous page. And briefly, just speaking, Omar is from Futa Toro, which is nowadays in Senegal. He was captured in a conflict, as he told us in his autobiography in 1807 and sold to slavers who brought him to Charleston, South Carolina, where he spent two years. And in 1810, he ran away and came to Fayetteville, where he was recaptured and repossessed and sold to the Owen family. That is a very prominent, wealthy, and well-respected family in North Carolina. 
His enslaver was James Owen. His brother was John Owen, who was the 24th governor of North Carolina. So Omar spent the rest of his life, 50 years in slavery, uh, moving between Wilmington and uh, Bladen County. So when he passed away in uh, during the Civil War in 1863, he left behind those Arabic uh, uh, texts that were really never translated or uh, pro- presented to a larger public. So in this book that you just, uh, in front of you, which came out in uh, August this year, we try to argue that the Omar's uh, writings were not understood due to uh, the systematic way in which defenders of slavery, racism, were, dealed, were dealing with this uh, Omar's writing. And our primary objective in this book is basically to just restore Omar's voice and also provide a cultural intellectual background that is rooted in Islamist, in Islamic teaching and meanings in, in uh, West Africa. So I will let Carl just go to the next page and talk about one of Omar's most significant uh, writing, which is his autobiography, which he wrote in 1831. And Carl can talk about that briefly. So thank you, Cole, for having us here. We're very privileged to be part of this program. Let me say that when we began to enter this project, we asked ourselves the question, has anyone established what are in the writings of Omar Ibn Sayyid? Because the critical edition is the basic fundamental first step in any humanistic project involving a text. And we were shocked to realize that nobody had done this work. And when we began to dig into the manuscripts, we realized that he was quoting works in poetry, works on theology, works on Sufism, and nobody had recognized this before. Moreover, it was clear that everything that was published about Omar during his lifetime was basically a lie because it contradicts what's in his his own writings. So we want to show you an example of the challenge that these writings pose to us. And we'll take a look at the so-called autobiography, which is not actually an autobiography at all. However, it is labeled here on the right. You can see these are the annotations that were added in English by his enslavers, which describe this as the life of Omar ibn Said, called Moro, a fellow slave in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Etc. Now, let me show you the first pages of this notebook. I'm going to skip over the first four pages. They are quotations from a section of the Quran, the 67th chapter called Surat al-Mulk. He then, on page five, begins the text in a handwriting that's twice as large as the preceding and following lines. And he says, he is addressing uh, some person that we have not got a clear identity for. He calls him Sheikh Hunter. He says, Sheikh Hunter, I cannot write my life. This is the title we have taken for our book. He says that he's forgotten much of his language along with the Arabic language. And then he turns to another audience, which is not there. He says, oh, my brothers, do not blame me. We believe these, these are his colleagues in the theological academy he attended for 25 years in West Africa. And then, after he's already said that he's forgotten his Arabic, he comes back with a quotation from a text which he had obviously memorized, because he had no library with him from carried from Senegal when he was enslaved. And so this is a theological text about what we call the doctrine of unrestricted grace, where he says, God bestows his bounties that overflow with the good. This is a fundamental theological text, well known in North and West Africa. And he's quoting it at the beginning of this work. This is a signal that would only have been understandable to people who had studied these texts that he had memorized. Now, he has just said he cannot write his life. So what happens next? A blank page. Another blank page. another and another. Eight blank pages. 
And then he starts again and he says to Sheikh Hunter, you asked me to write my life. I cannot write my life. Those eight pages of blank space are a protest against a command that he was given as a slave. It's important to realize that although there were probably 95 to 100 so-called slave narratives written in America before the Civil War published, all of them were written by people who had been liberated from slavery, except one, Omar. He was the only one who was writing still in the condition of slavery. So the question of being able to write his life is extremely problematic. And in addition, we won't go into the details of this, but if you look at this so-called autobiography, it has five sections. Each of these is rewritten as if to say, you want, me, you want me to write my life? I can write it this way and I can write it that way. Neither one of them is actually me. And there's another feature of this text that is very strange, where he addresses a third audience that is not present and not able to read his works. He says, oh, people of South Carolina, people of North Carolina, people of America. And it sounds like he's leading up to a very important announcement. But the only thing he says is, my master, Jim Owen, is a very good master. He treats me well. He actually says more about the family of his enslavers than he says about himself in this autobiography. So this is a very unusual document. It is not, in any sense of the word, a, a narrative that we could take to be truly expressive of the, of the history of this man. And it also reflects the fact that nobody could understand his works, his writings, and so they made up fiction instead. So I'm going to turn this back over to Mbai to talk about the so-called experts and the misinterpretations which they place upon Omar. Thank you, Carl. Um, two points that are very relevant to Carl's uh, wonderful presentation there. One is we, in our research, we found two uh, two hunters. One is Eli Hunter and one is James Hunter. Eli Hunter was a, a reverend here in North Carolina in, uh, uh, in Raleigh. And uh, Eli, James Hunter was very active in New England. He was very active with this uh, 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 Ameri American missionary groups that were trying to send free black to uh, Liberia. So it has to be one of them that Omar is talking to. That's why he's addressing him in a very respectful manner, Sheikh Hunter. The second point is also it is important for us, um, and this I think most scholars who deal with Omar's text before, for uh, translations before this one, uh, did not think it through, which is uh, uh, autobi auto slave narratives generally, or freedom narratives, if you will, were written in the in in the context of a European Enlightenment. So they talk about reason, they talk about the separation of power, they talk about freedom and so on. Omar doesn't talk about this because the European Enlightenment it is more in the context of politics, not ethics. But where Omar came from, things are in the context of ethics. So it is very important to look at the two different framings here. Uh, one more point that is very important to, to put it in context is Omar was enslaved um, among many Africans who were enslaved between the 16th and, uh, and between the, from the 16th to the 19th century through what the Europeans used to call the golden trade, which is cargo of carrying European goods to Africa, exchange with, or with enslaved people brought to uh, the new world and sold to the European um, colonies, and then the capital goes back to Europe, which 
build and develop European industri- industries, and then the the trade start again from from Africa. So it is triangular trade or Atlantic slave trade. So that is the context that lasted for four hundred years. In most estimate, the, the enslaved African brought to America the numbers range from 12 million to 100 million. So each scholar can give reasoning to why that number is either low or high. Uh, in any case, Omar was brought to America in 18 or early 18, 1808. So that was the end of the international slave trade. And he spent the rest of his life here. So one in chapter five of the book, we try to think through what prevent the scholarship that existed in America from understanding Omar's writing, from understanding Muslims, who were really a large segment of the enslaved population, from understanding Islam itself. So if you look at people surrounding Omar, this white man, very powerful, to your left we have John Owen, that is our governor, 24th governor of North Carolina. His brother was the richest man uh, during that time. And John, John Owen, some people argue, actually came so close to be the vice president of President Harrison early on because he was extremely powerful and very wealthy. And you have John Lewis Taylor, that is the first chief justice of North Carolina. Omar's first documented writing in 1819 was given to him because he addressed it to the Owens. And there, actually, he's asking to be returned to Africa, even saying the village where he should be returned to. But this document were never translated. It was translated in late, I mean, 15 or 20 years ago. So we were interested in why was Omar's request to be returned to Africa was not translated. So we tracked the document, was given to the justice uh, uh, Taylor, who gave it to his friend Francis Scott Key, who is who wrote the lyric of our, you know, um, national anthem, who was also a lawyer and, and a poet. So he's the one who gave it to a professor who who was at what became Yale University, Professor Stewart. And Carl and I actually follow Professor Stewart's files, recall his documents, and we just discovered he couldn't because he didn't even have the level of second year Arabic. So there is no way that person can translate Omar was writing on classical Arabic, drawing on 9th and 8th century authors. This is also far right. You have the first Arabist in the U.S. State Department. And that is an interesting story about him, actually. And he was very involved with Omar and tried to hire Omar as his research assistant, but Omar turned him down. So that is that is a story you can read in the book. Uh, next. And here's another group of, yeah, next page. Yeah, the group of missionaries also who were very involved with Omar. They were the intermediaries between Omar's writing and 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 the, the and, and and the general public. Uh, there is an interesting story here to know what happened. How did because this was the 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 way in which southern enslavers um, reacted to the rise of abolitionist movement in the country prior to the Civil War. A gentleman by the name of uh, William Capers, he was a long time editor of a Southern Christian you know, magazine, came to the Southerners and told them, hey, if the Negro could not be trusted with the gospel, really Christianity will be at war with uh, slavery. Prior to that, the enslavers were not interested in promoting Christianity among enslaved blacks. But he told them if he could be made a good Christian, then that would be really a God's favor and our conscience will be satisfied. So they accepted his offer. That is the time really around 1940s where, you know, plantation uh, owners opened their plantation on weekend to enslave people and start, start promoting Christianity. What they did at the time was also to invite missionary groups who were very pro-slavery into the plantations. And Arabic writing of this enslaved group, enslaved people, because many, not, yeah, we, we have detected a, a significant number of enslaved Africans who, who wrote in Arabic. This document were given to these missionaries and asked to translate it. So that is why this, you know, uh, disregard and distort, distortion of this document really uh, came from. The second thing the enslavers did was to start producing images and portraits of these enslaved people that were very friendly to the peculiar institutions. Omar's extent images, three of them are discussed in the book, were product of this, you know, uh, 
new uh, policy. But if you look at these groups, really the, the, the significant portion is why did they really miss Omar's message and fail to translate what Omar was writing, Omar and others? So we argue that one, because there is a, the, there is a problem in the systematic way in which they, answer, the, they use expertise in order to manage slave-based society. That itself is antithesis to the mission of humanism itself. So that is one, one, one of the reasons. The second one was the fusion between missionary group and slavery also is problematic. So these two reasons are the causes in which uh, earlier scholars, missionary groups, and uh, uh, people of knowledge fail to understand Omar's writing, fail to understand Islam, and fail to understand the uh, Arabic. Yeah, next. I, I think Carl will pick up the next uh, aspect of, yeah. This, this, this were just the 18 documents that we deal with during our writing, and um, they were extremely helpful in, helpful in in helping us give Omar his voice and allow the reader to understand what Omar was saying directly. Yeah. Carl, you can pick it up from here. Yeah. So here's a picture of the document. We have about uh, five minutes for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. This gives you a, a sense of what the documents look like. These are sermons in large part. The the texts which Omar quotes are sometimes from the Quran. There's 26 quotations from the Quran, a half a dozen from the Bible. He quotes the Quranic critique of the arrogance of the wealthy very frequently. And in one in his first document, his 1819 letter to the Owen brothers, he quotes a Sufi poem from the 12th century, which says, You who's turning gray. By God, what are you waiting for? Have you not recognized the fate of those before you, my brother? Are you insane or are you an idiot? Your beard is white, but your heart is black. <laughs> this is addressed to the enslavers. They had no idea what he said. Omar also creates his documents with geometric talismanic drawings which are meant for healing and protection. And we're frequently, in several of these examples, addressed to the children of the Owen family, with whom Omar had an affectionate relationship. We've established an archive of Arabic texts and translations, of starting with Omar's documents, which is available online at the University of North Carolina. And we are going to add the writings of other enslaved African Muslim scholars because we feel that they deserve to have their voices heard. And they have been ignored and distorted for so long that it's time to fix that. And so this is just a quick example of the text that Omar quotes. He was not speaking at random. He, he had memorized these documents in his theological academy training and into his 80s, he was still able to quote these from memory. And so this is where we get the conclusions from Omar's writings. He, he says, I cannot write my life because nobody could read what he was writing. Mm -hmm. When he mentions his enslavers with praise, we feel this is ironic. And the autobiography is better regarded as a message in a bottle aimed at an audience that did not exist at the time, but which may exist today. And so we feel that Omar's writings are demonstration of the fact that Arabic was an American language at the beginning of our country's history. And Islam was an American religion. So the problem of overcoming racism and the effects of slavery is still with us. But our hope is, and I've, here we join with Rhiannon Giddens and Michael Abels, we re admire and respect the creative work which they have done with the Omar opera. And we hope that when Omar says, oh, people of America, that this will be heard. 
Professors Lowe and Ernst, thank you so much for that revealing and intriguing look at your epic text. Um, I've read it twice now. I look forward to it, reading it a third time just because there's so much in there to, to take in. Uh, we are in quite a busy season, our 100th and 101st season at San Francisco Opera, so it may be till the uh, winter holidays that I get that chance to read it a third time, but I do look forward to that. Thank you so much. And speaking of that opera, I am so thrilled to now turn our discussion towards our members of the cast and our conductor. Um, where to begin? Wow. Uh, first of all, John, Brittany, and Taylor, thank you so much for being here with us today. I know that you are in busy times right now. Tomorrow is our dress rehearsal at the War Memorial Opera House of Omar, and I'm so excited to be there tomorrow, along with hundreds of school students uh, from middle school, high school, and colleges that are going to be witnessing this dress rehearsal. Um, and then, of course, on Sunday, November 3rd, we open it uh, live at the War Memorial Opera House and to the world. Uh, so we're so excited for that. Are you guys ready? Is the production ready? How is Omar coming? Uh, John, let's start with you. Omar's doing great. This is a, an incredible cast and an amazing orchestra and company. So we're going to have a wonderful opera. <laughs> yes, indeed. Excellent. And let's go mothers first. So playing the role of Omar's mother. Taylor, how are you feeling about tomorrow's dress rehearsal and Sunday's opening? I'm just really excited to finally have an audience. We've been working on it for a little while now, and that feeling of having an audience can't be replicated. So I'm just really excited to share the story with, with other people. Absolutely. And in the role of Julie, Brittany, how are we feeling for the days uh, ahead? Julie's a fictional character. <laughs> she, she is a fictional character, but she definitely helps helps the story, the progression of the story. Um, Again, you know, just as John and Taylor said, just ready for an audience. We've been working really hard for the past actual month. And so it feels good to finally hopefully get that energy from the audience and to kind of receive their interpretation and what they relate to. So I can't wait. Mm -hmm. We all can't wait. We have bated breath for this, this uh, San Francisco premiere. Uh, my next question is also for Brittany and Taylor. Um, when we look at the operas that so many people are used to seeing, that canon that drives opera houses worldwide, um, I think most people that are fans, aficionados of opera, all agree that the emotions in opera are so strong. It is perhaps what compels us all to witness opera. And as heartbroken as we, as we may be by the end of La Traviata or Madame Butterfly, I don't think those emotions can even compare to the emotions that come in the retelling of Omar's story. Can you uh, talk to us about some of the emotions that you yourselves feel while portraying these roles? Oh, wow. Um, you know, right off the bat, honestly, um, it's this sense, I actually I feel this sense of joy a little bit because it's a story that not many people get to hear or even understand or even relate to in a little bit. And so I think when you put it on the stage, at least for me, is that when I actually am able to sing Rhiannon's and Michael's music with um, this amazing San Francisco orchestra, that it's a sense of joy and really diving, I feel like, into the text and that feeling of really connecting and really bringing that out so that the audience can understand that and feel that. Um, I know there have been some, uh, I should say, harder feelings, I should say, when it comes to, especially this course, since it's such a historical story of telling it and kind of reliving certain things. But in the end, I think by the, at least for me, is that when Julie comes in by that second act and is really diving into her, telling her him to tell his story and to, and to really go about it in a way that is so spiritual and so grounding that it feels so together and just so joyous. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. Taylor, what say you to that same question? You know, it's so complex. Um, the story has so much love and joy and, and success and hope in it, but there's also true devastation. And I think the mother kind of carries a lot of that. You know, we all like, I mean, I know, and I'm, you know, as a black woman who has a child, that feeling of helplessness that you can't save your child or help them. And I know the first scene that, that we have with, with that I have with Omar, 
you know, there's a moment of, of a feeling of, you know, surrender that this is just going to happen and there's nothing that she can do to protect her child. Um, that's just, it, it just gets me every time. Um, but I think that there's such a beauty in his story. Um, I've told the music staff and, and everyone that I'm actually from Fayetteville, you know, grew up there, was born there and have this connection to this place that he lived for so many years. And I, I've only heard of him because of this opera. So I feel this like strong connection to, to this now. And um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a very complex and rewarding opportunity to be a part of, of this story. Absolutely. Thank you. And John, our maestro, uh, you've been involved with this opera um, since its premiere in Spoleto and perhaps beforehand. And so actually, that, that's my first question to you. When did you first become involved with this opera? <laughs> wow. Well, in, in a sense, even before it was this opera, because we were looking for a commission at the Spoleto Festival to tell a Charleston story and to tell a story of enslavement. And we were even, think we were even thinking about maybe it would be about Denmark Vesey. And then we, we were alerted to the autobiography and pivoted. And um, and then, you know, once we had our creative team on board, you know, we began workshopping it in 2018. So it's been a long process, a beautiful process of of being involved in this and learning so much more um, along the way, even like with this new wonderful book by these professors, um, which has, has been a revelation to me, too, because it affirms so much of the sort of musicological archaeology that Rhiannon has done in her life and practice that she brings into this opera, not just through the music, but also through the libretto. And it's it's joyous. I mean, as as Brittany and, and Taylor were um, saying, there's something that happens in the second act in which we are celebrating Omar preserving his mind and his soul and his spirit. And that that is something that's confirmed through this scholarship and which is um, affirmed in the most glorious way in the music. And John, uh, they'll undoubtedly be um, members of our audience in San Francisco who, who perhaps saw the premiere in Spoleto, uh, perhaps even workshops before that. Will they be seeing the exact same show or has it changed in certain ways? You know, the, the music and opera is the same. The production here is is bigger than what we did in Charleston uh, based on theater size. And so, in essence, there are two similar productions by Kaneza Scholl that look uh, very much the same. Uh, but this one, which was built by Los Angeles Opera, is for, on a larger scale and, and I think Kaneza would express that it is like the the one because it is realizing all of the stagecraft that she was imagining with her team. We always hope that the production of the San Francisco Opera are the one. Yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> hope that proves to be true. Um, Brittany and Taylor, I'm wondering, in terms of our audiences that are going to see this, what do you think is most important for them to know or think about before they come to witness this story? And that's not an easy question, so you might not have the perfect answer, but uh, you have more experience with the story than, than certainly I do. What, what is your, your advice to our audience? Whoever unmutes first gets to go first. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, oh, I mean, Taylor. <laughs> I mean, definitely come with an open mind and an open mind of understanding one story, and I should say different groups, different whatever group that might be, but the idea of understanding different groups' identity and understanding um, the struggles that might come with sharing one identity and also the 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 what's the word i don't want to go back to joy but i mean that idea of um the feeling of understanding and just kind of getting that I, it's so complex but i i know the biggest thing especially with this is the understanding of just identity and being able to relate to it or not relate, but at least coming with that idea of just openness to like really hear and see and to take in another story that might 
you're not used to. It's not, it's not Italian, it's not French, and all those are all wonderful. But here's a story about an Islamic scholar that no one probably, especially within this opera world, unless you've read the wonderful autobiography, that you're not used to. And so just to come with that openness, I feel of you know, including and just understanding that here is another story that you might relate to. And it's okay if you don't, but, you know, just be open to it. Thank you, Brittany. And yeah. Um, yeah, I I think this, I, I'm thinking of the final scene in the show, which I think is extremely beautiful and um, kind of this like fugue canon moment where we're all singing at different times. And it made me, it makes me think every time of it, of this story being kind of unifying. I think this is everyone's story. It's not just, you know, African-Americans that are going to relate to this story. You're going to see yourself up there in some way. Um, and uh, I think that, I think it's going to change minds and, and change hearts and give people an opportunity to see see this kind of story that we've been told in a very sterile way in school and whatever, it's going to show us that human, the human side of it, what it really kind of feels and looks like. And music is such a beautiful vehicle for that, for, for holding that emotion and, and all of those things. So I, I just think that, I think it's, it's kind of a, a life changer, this piece and, and his story in general. Hmm. Thank you, Taylor. And John, my next question is for you. Um, one of the wonderful things in my role of working on a new production like this is the research that I have to end up doing um, to reference back to a Puccini or Verdi opera. You know, I know how those go. I know how it ends. No spoiler alerts. With something like this, I really have to do a lot of digging to find out more about it and to find out more about the musical language they were going to experience. And so in doing that, I did a whole lot of listening to the fabulous music of Rihanna Giddens. And even in just exploring her albums, I was astonished by the breadth of diversity within the musical language that she uses, whether it be um, harking back to country music, blues music, spirituals, Celtic music. Um, what, what can we expect from the music we're going to hear in Omar? Oh, my goodness. There's so much to talk about here. But um, as as Anne had alluded to in her opening introduction, you know, the, the opera starts with a transcription uh, of a melody from 1707. OK, so this is this in Europe. This is the time of like Bach and Handel. Right. But it's this is music from. At West Africa that's been transcribed in the Caribbean. And that tune opens this opera and is the theme of the overture. Yeah. And there are so many musical vocabularies that are used, as you mentioned, Cole, um, that that I think help us think about and examine what is normative classical or historical music. These these traditions which come through, whether they're bluegrass, whether they're um, square dance, whether they're the blues, right? They they go back centuries and they involve a lot of cultural collision and assimilation. And and ultimately, you know, Rhiannon would talk about this more eloquently and personally because she did the work and, and put this opera together. But ultimately, this is American classical music, if you will. And it belongs just as much as normative classical or historical music as any other material that that might be heard in an opera house. And I'll give you an example. This opera like takes place in 1807 and then like 1810 and in the environs there. And if we think about it and we're hearing this music as expressing that time and this story, well, in those years, 1807, Verdi and Wagner weren't born yet. And Verdi, of course, you know, matured into writing music that used the Italian vernacular and 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 setting arias that way. And I think this opera very shrewdly kind of merges traditions here in in the most incredibly deep way. These two composers, Michael Abels and Rhiannon Giddens, and and so musically, I invite audiences to listen to that. And if, and can I say another thing? just about audience 
um, inviting the audience to think about something. You know, at an early Q&A at one of our workshops in New York, someone asked Rhiannon about like this being a black story. And she was like, well, wait, this is a white story, too. And it's her her libretto is so shrewd in adapting the scholarship and, and the words of Omar. And I would invite audiences, in particular, our white audience members, to think about the five white characters in this opera and how they still they represent, even in their language in 1810, um, attitudes that still persist 200 years later. Right. Even if it's the most overtly racist in Johnson who makes fun of someone for not understanding English. Right. That didn't end with slavery, you know, or or with Owen and his sort of paternalistic, shall we say, neoliberal attitude. I've, I've got to show you the way, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these white characters have things for all of us white people to unpack, shall we say, even in the contemporary um, era. And and I, I encourage audiences to look at that, that this is not just some historical artifact or cultural tourism of an African-American story. Thank you so much for that, John. And mm -hmm. we talked a lot about Rihanna, and of course, she invited her colleague, Michael Abels, to, to join her in the composition of this work. Can you talk to us at all about what he brought to, to this score and what their collaboration was like? Oh, Michael's an amazing musician. And, um, you know, the the story of the composition of the opera, I think, I think is fairly well known. Rhiannon wrote a lot of it on the banjo and would sing it. And she'd be on the road or she'd be at home in Ireland and she would, you know, make voice memos in her phone and send them to Michael. And he would he would do the transcription to notation and um, they would work very closely in developing it in terms in terms of the orchestral fabric, which Michael composed. Um, so he's doing much more than orchestrating. Uh, there are significant chunks of the opera that he composed. Um, well, it is Rhiannon who set her words, you know, in, and with those melodies and um and and Michael's uh, sensibility brought so much shape to the structure of the opera as well. It flows so well. It the the sense of scenography and action is unusually strong in for any opera of any era. And um, I think in that he exhibits like incredible, shall we say, aesthetic intelligence in terms of how you create music that really flows and holds the listener. Thank you so much, John. Mm -hmm. And to uh, chime back in with our professors, professors, have you seen this opera yet? Yes. And Carl, where did you I saw it in Chapel Hill, and it was amazing. Our Memorial Hall, which actually has the name of John Owen written in, into the wall at one place, had an audience of 2,000, and they were, it was a standing ovation for 10 minutes after the conclusion. It was so inspiring, and it, it was a serious opera, a serious piece of storytelling, serious piece of music. And people were uplifted, not by some kind of fairy tale, but by the human drama and even with its tragic dimensions. And I was so pleased that at the climax of the second act, we had consulted a bit with uh, Charlotte Braithwaite when the first phase of planning was taking place for the Spoleto production. I looked at the libretto and we sent some notes and so they included, Rhiannon included the one of the verses of poetry from an Arabic theological text at the very climax of the second act. And so that was really a thrill to see that take place. And do you have any guidance for our audience as they prepare to see this, this retelling of Omar's story? Well, I, I, I saw it in, uh, in Charleston last summer, and I also saw it here in North Carolina um, in the spring. I mean, it, it is a work of art. I, I enjoy it. Beautiful. And it reminds me, and I was telling my students the same story, that, um, and it is something that we discussed in the first chapter of the book, Many Ways of Knowing. In Africa, it is um, oral wisdom, literacy, and education. 
So it is just beautiful that um, our publications coming out, one way of understanding Omar, there is also this opera about Omar. So people will have more than one option to understand Omar. And I uh, actually talked to some friends overseas who are interested in looking at how to incorporate opera into their work about Omar. So it is good. It is, it is, it is a good time. It is good for business as well to have a book that is right there and the opera both are addressing the same issue. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left in our time together. My, how quickly time goes when you're having fun. Um, I want to give Anne a chance to chime in and ask questions she might have. But before you do that, Anne, I just want to remind our live audience that we'd love to hear from you as well. So if you're watching us live, please feel free to uh, uh, submit questions through uh, the chat feature, and we'll do our best to address those. And with that, Anne, please go ahead. Yes. Um... I think it's been, it's been interesting digging, sorry, interesting digging into some of the aspects of this and the expectations that you go forward with it. I've seen Rhiannon do her work and I, I said, well, now how, how, how does this translate into opera work? And now understanding that the, the lushness that you expect from grand opera comes from her relationship to um Abel's to the to the composer the other composer um and that it seems as though you may walk in quite perplexed but does it resolve does it how does how do those how does the banjo resolve with you know 50 singers and a violins Great question. Well, you know, there is no banjo in the orchestra. That right. was that was one of the earliest decisions. But it's it's sort of portrayed through the body of the orchestra, through different orchestral techniques that Michael uses, whether it's in the harp or plucked strings and etc. So the simplicity of the instrumentation that she performs with is is brought into the orchestral milieu. Is, is that what happens? Very much so. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's it's necessarily evocative of the banjo. I mean, it's evocative of the banjo and and shall we say West African version of it, like a kora. But and, and we hear allusions to it. But they did. Michael and Rhiannon deliberately wanted to translate that vocabulary into the the opera orchestra, and so. Uh, even throughout um, other passages that, shall we say, might evoke North African music. Uh, this is done through, you know, things like grace notes and slides and the particular sounds of certain kinds of woodwind instruments um, that that help that have that versatility to express that coloristically. So it comes across it's at certain points. I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. For us, as grand opera, quote. oh, most definitely, and 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 they wanted it. To, they wanted to write a grand opera. They stated that, and so they wanted an overture. They wanted a big choruses that were prominent in the opera, in which the chorus would stand in relief to the principal characters. They wanted dance sequence like a ballet, and then they wanted arias and duets and ariettas and all those sort of ensemble numbers. And so they made it using very much using the vocabulary of traditional grand opera, but it's hardly anachronistic. It's very much a 21st century piece. It sounds very much like what, what we're now beginning to what's beginning to emerge, <clears throat> what we'd call American operas, you know, the American way of doing opera with composers that San Francisco has used and more recently bringing in <clears throat> African American and Latino composers to the to the fold. And the one of the other question I had, and uh, uh, panelists, please jump in. The other question I had was, what struck me first was, you know, this is a wonderful story for these times because it's promoting the value of literacy. 
and especially having a book coming out now also to support that value that what when when I think it's great for for students for high school students particularly to understand the role that literacy did play does play <laughs> and that it the the literary li- literary part and the musical part can merge to make a beautiful experience that's what i'm looking forward to am i am i is it okay to look forward to that <laughs> indeed thank you ann um i am curious what everybody is up to next john what is what is in your docket after Omar closes. I have a composition deadline because I'm also a composer. So I'm working on an opera that I have to finish at least in draft form for a workshop that's coming in the spring. So I'm really looking forward to my own creative time. Excellent. As a composer myself, uh, my condolences and also um, (laughs) fun times ahead. Uh, Brittany, how about you? What stages will you be seen on next? Yeah, um, I'm actually heading back to New York City and I'll be with the cast of Carmen, uh, the new production that is heading up there. I'll be covering Michaela and then continuing to uh, fire shut up my bones again and the reprise of that as uh, Destiny, Greta and Loneliness. Really excited. Mm -hmm. How fabulous. I so enjoyed uh, witnessing you in that production. I, like thousands of others, was watching it on a movie screen at the Met Simulcasts. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I'll get there to see it in person this time. And um, today, yes. well, the composer is the new executive director of San Francisco Jazz Center. Yes, yes, I just saw that. <laughs> I know, I, I should actually tell him to like come to see Omar. <laughs> okay, <give> call. <laughs> and Taylor, what's next for you? Um, I have my, you know, usual uh, December Messiah <laughs> I'll be doing with the uh, Memphis Symphony and then and then uh, Floss Hilda and Wagner's Dust Wrangled with the L.A. Phil, which I'm really looking forward to. And Rosina with Seattle Opera. So, yeah. And professors, what are you writing next? Are you already on to another epic volume of some sort? You're muted, Jim, by... Well, we, still, we, yeah, yeah. We are still hoping to get more of Omar's documents. You know, we discover there are dozens of missing, missing documents that were written by Omar. Hopefully, someone will read this book and come up with more. So the story is an evolving story, and we are still also working on translating and publishing all the unslave African Muslim writings, and we will disseminate it on online and. Hopefully, the next book will be a continuation of Omar's story. And let me respond to Anne's comment. I thought your point about literacy was very important. And the thing is that when people hear the story of Omar, for some reason, they feel that it makes slavery seem worse than it w- than they thought. Mm. That, that a literate, an educated person could be subjected to this. And it shouldn't make any difference, right? But... What's really important is that it teaches us that there was a literary tradition in Africa. Yes. It was deep. Yeah. And then nobody knew anything about. Right. And so this is something that needs to be recognized. I agree. Thank you. And uh, Jessica in our live audience uh, says that she uh, likes how San Francisco Opera is expanding its repertoire to attract different audiences. Thank you for noting that, Jessica. That is absolutely a huge goal as we enter our second century. Uh, she goes on to ask, what activities is SF Opera implementing to make sure that this opera gets seen by the widest audience? Um, as I mentioned before, we have hundreds of school students, middle school through college, attending our dress rehearsal tomorrow. We have been reaching out to schools, to churches, to community organizations, to anybody we can think of, anybody that we know, letting them know that we are retelling this story, that we are remembering Omar's name. And then yes, at San Francisco Opera in our second century, we are making huge efforts to make sure that we are telling everybody's stories and that the stories we tell on our stage represent all the people that we want to welcome into our house. So we hope that that is evident as you witness not just this story, but witness the audiences that come to see that story at San Francisco Opera. And one other quick question from the audience. This is for Brittany and Taylor. Assuming that your roles in Omar are now your favorite roles to perform, what is maybe a second or third favorite role of yours in the operatic 
literature. <laughs> oh wow! <Not> later, <laughs> you know, every such a popular question. Honestly, I always like to say it's whatever role that I'm working on. I feel like I can. If I think about it that way, I can just dive in and focus directly on that and just kind of give all into that one role. Um, but you know me, I, I you know I love my Italian opera, so I'm not gonna say no <laughs> to breaking open a Violetta, the, oh, excuse me, Traviata, or you know the the just feel good Bohème. <laughs> You know, <laughs> he's not feeling so good by the end, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, not by the end, not by the end. But you know, Puccini as a composer is is wonderful as well. But we knew him a lot, yeah. Uh-huh. And I Taylor. just saw uh, Trovatore, and uh, I don't like Trovatore. I think it's a stupid opera, totally stupid opera. Although the the music's really good, and the um, what's her name, Angel Blue or Angel something. Blue. Well, hey, you know, show kids. <laughs> She reached the back of the house, the back row, just just fabulously. And I think that's one thing. I'm so happy to see you, all of you um, as part of representing what I think San Francisco Opera is doing, not only with the, the quality of singer, but the variety of singer it's bringing to the stage. I'm not being paid to say this. And also the beautiful production quality. This is something that you don't get to see. People don't understand until they get to experience it live at a house like that, where the wonderfulness of the production and the quality and beauty of the performance, the singing anyway, we don't always feel that way about the acting, but the performances, you can count on it being a beautiful experience. Absolutely. And Taylor, a, a second or third favorite role outside of Omar? Yeah, I mean, I'm really bad at picking favorites because it just changes so much. But I um, I really love French repertoire. Um, I love, you know, singing, you know, like Charlotte and Carmen and all of those things. And I also really love singing like Rossini and things that move. I love to uh, do that kind of stuff. So I'm all over the place. But yeah. Fabulous. Well, thank you to our audience members for those questions. Before I pass it back to Anne to wrap up our time, I want to remind audiences that the Pulitzer Prize winning opera Omar by award winning composers Rian and Giddens and Michael Abels takes to the stage at the War Memorial Opera House here in San Francisco, produced by San Francisco Opera, November 1st through the 20th, sorry, November 5th. <laughs> Through the 21st, November 5th is already sold out and the remaining performances are selling quickly. So get your tickets right now. Go to San Francisco sfopera.com or you can call our box office at 415-864-3330. Get your tickets worldwide. You can see it as well. We stream one performance of every single one of our titles each season. So please be sure to go online and get that streaming ticket if you're interested in that. Even if you're not available to watch it at the moment it's being streamed, that video becomes on demand the next day at 10 a.m. Pacific time, and you have 48 hours to watch it to your heart's content before that video link goes away. So we still look forward to welcoming audiences to the War Memorial Opera House for this exciting production. And of course, at that time, you can get your own copy of I Cannot Write My Life. It is on sale at our gift shop. We are also giving away hundreds of copies of it to many of the guests that we are inviting to join us for this opera. With That's that, right. Anne, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Cole. And I'm teaching all of my senior friends how to stream so they can <laughs> be sure to see it if they can't get to a performance because it's been what I saw jobs. It was beautifully directed. It, it wasn't just parking the camera. It was just really very well directed, so I encourage that. And so thanks again so much, my dear friend Cole. Uh, and uh, from the opera, John Kennedy and Brittany uh, Renee and Taylor Raven. Oh boy, this is this is a hot show, as we say, uh, <laughs> and, and very, very loosely. Um, <clears throat> and Bay Lowe and uh, Carl Ernst, thank you so much. We really, really learned a great deal about opera and literacy, about um, enslavement, uh, reaching areas that we perhaps 
hadn't thought about. And we are totally um, looking forward to more beautiful and wonderful and exciting music from San Francisco Opera, Rhiannon Giddens and Michael Abels and all of you. We invite um, the performance, you to go to the performances and you also will be able to see this um, video uh, by tuning in to the commonwealthclub.org. It'll be on our YouTube or on our website. So as, as Cole said, it'll go on forever. Um, the website recordings will be available soon. So on I'm behalf of the other panels presented by San Francisco Opera and Commonwealth Club. So check those out. Yes, well. they are right from last year. Anthony, Ultimo Sueño. Uh -huh. we, had, we had a great time with that. That, you know, goes back for several years. Um, so you'll be able to listen to this program and the others. And um, I invite you to tune in to the Commonwealth Club to at, come to the Commonwealth Club. November, we're being overwhelmed by the APEC convention, which is going to evidently uh, take up a lot of the space at the Commonwealth Club. So uh, maybe, maybe we should be happy we were able to Zoom. Um, but on behalf of the Member-Led Arts Forum, co-chaired by myself, Dr. Ann W. Smith, and Robert Melton, who deals with the visual arts materials, we're so delighted that you joined us today. During this, the Commonwealth Club's 120th year, we're a little older than the opera, <laughs> our 120th year of enlightened public discussion. And now, this meeting is adjourned.